Thank you. Thank you. Improvisation is the art of making stuff up. And we all do it every day, all day. As my friend Kat Coppett reminds us, nobody wakes up in the morning and finds a script for the day sitting on their bedside table telling them what their lines are. We're constantly improvising. And when you were kids, as Kathy reminded us this morning, you did this even more, and you were really good at it. Not only did you live in a uh, continuously unscripted world, but your imagination ran wild. And somewhere along the way, you may have found that you started to get a little bit locked up. As you got older, you learned how to plan ahead and to play it safe and to uh, try to appear normal or to fit in. Yeah? And you learned how to prepare and you learned how to, how to focus and set goals and how to hold yourself to a higher standard. And that was good. It helped. As you've grown up, you've been able to achieve more and you've been able to take on more and you've been able to stress out more. <laughs> and as Keith Johnstone describes, the vibrant, bright colors of your childhood maybe have started to run a little dry. The world might have gotten a little bit duller and a little bit grayer and a little bit less magical. Now, in my experience, Revisiting that childlike improvisational mode is an amazing way to rekindle the magic, to reduce your stress, and to help you reap personal and professional rewards. I'm convinced of this. Let me ask this question before I move on. Do we have any theatrical improvisers in the audience? I know we have a few, people who study improv performance. Just a few, great. And you guys have seen it, anyone, people who haven't, who don't study it, you've seen it on stage. People get up on stage and they make up stories and plays and scenes from audience suggestions. That's the kind of improv I'm talking about, but it goes way beyond the stage. The applications are incredible. I want to share the three ways that I've found personally that it helps in your career. A study and practice of improvisation does three things. It will boost your creativity, it will expand your status and the roles that you're able to play, and it will revitalize your play. You guys want to hear these things? You want to see how this works? We're good to go? It's pretty late in the day, and I want to I run, run you into this right away. Here's the deal. In order to start, I just need you to find a partner, someone you're sitting near. You can know them or not know them. It doesn't matter. Grab a partner. It only works with one partner. So if you have a pair, if you have a partner and you see someone who doesn't have a partner, invite them to join your group, but they will watch and then rotate in, all right? So you've got one partner and then you can rotate in a third person if you need to. Good, everyone's got your partner? Good, I need a partner. Can I have Rockman? Yeah, come on up, man. All right, thanks Rockman, thanks for coming up. All right, we talked about this just briefly a second ago. Here's what you're gonna do, you're gonna play a little game with your partner. This is an Augusta Boal theater game. It's called one, two, three. You're going to count to three as fast as you can with your partner, but you're going to go back and forth. And when you get to three, you're going to start over. It looks or sounds like this. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Just like that, as fast as you can. If you mess up, just start over. All right, ready, go. Um, let me get my bell. Yeah, stay right here, that's good. Rotate in if you've got a third person, rotate in, let them try it too. Go faster. All right, good, stop right there. Good, anyone, raise your hand if you made it to three. Anyone make it to three? Did you get there? Okay, good, just wanna make sure. Anyone mess up? Raise your hand if you mess up. Yeah, isn't that amazing? It's like the finger thing. How is it? I, I used to tell people that messing up in this game is a sign of intelligence. It's not true. It's not, it, isn't, it isn't correlated at all with intelligence. Everybody messes up in the game. 
What did you do when you messed up? You laughed. Good. That is a very healthy response, especially in this activity with the stakes being so incredibly low. <laughs> Just laugh and move on. Great. Keep that. I, I'm interested in what else you did when you messed up. So I'm going to have you do it again, but I'm going to make it harder. We're going to demonstrate. This round, we're going to replace the one with a clap. So you're going to go clap. Two. Three. Two. Three, good, clap two, three, and notice what you do when you mess up. Ready, go. <laughs> oh, All right, good. Good, you messing up? You guys still messing up? Good. I'm watching you do it. This happens in every room. I'm seeing you mess up, and I'm seeing your bodies reacting. So it's not just that you're laughing and starting over. You're recoiling and clinching and cringing, and, and I see this move over here. Sometimes I see people hit themselves. It's, it's as if you're punishing yourself for messing up. Like, come on, man. The theory is you're actually doing that as a protective gesture. It's not just that you're closing off. You're also signaling to the world, don't worry, I'll punish him. You don't have to punish him. I got it. <laughs> it's safe. It's, it's defensive and guarded and protective, and it's not resourceful. It's not a healthy place to be. It's the first thing I teach improvisers is to change your physiological response to failure. So we're going to do it again, and I'm going to have you do the exact opposite of clinch off. For this, we call it the circus bow. You're going to throw your hands in the air and go, Ta-da! Everyone do that. One, two, three. Ta-da! Good. I want it fully the opposite of what your body wants to do. Just celebrate. I'm going to make it harder, though, so Rockman, we're going to demonstrate. This time it goes clap for one, snap for two, and then say three. Clap, snap, three, and if you mess up, say ta-da. Watch the rhythm. Three. 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 Okay, good. We didn't even mess up. All right, good. When you mess up, say ta-da. Ready? Go. All right, good. That was good. I'll bring you back. I'll bring you back up for the word of the time. Okay, I'll be over here. Good. All right. Great. That's great. It looks like you're all doing it at some level. That's awesome. How did it feel? People tell me two things. They say, it felt great, like this liberating sense. And people say, it felt weird, which it should be both. It should feel, there should be a level of discomfort. I'm pushing something here. I'm going to have you do it one more time. I want you to notice this, though. Was there ever a time when you noticed that your partner had messed up? Did you notice that? Maybe even before they noticed? You are a team. You're a pair. If they messed up, assume that it's because you did something wrong. You either, you either gave them the wrong prompt, or you looked at them funny, or you just did something that messed them up, and so that, but that means you get to celebrate too. So if either of you mess up, you both say ta-da together, and then you start over. You don't, we, don't, we're not, we don't have to debrief like who messed up or what happened. <laughs> just say ta-da and start over. I'm going to make it harder. Um, I want you to go really fast. A mistake in this round is a, even a pause is a mistake. So if you don't instantly do the next thing, then you both say ta-da and start over. This time, you're going to have to stand up because it's clap for one, snap for two, and stomp for three. Clap, snap, stomp. Ready, go. All right, good. Have a seat. Many of you are doing this naturally, but please give your partner or partners a high five. I want to I point something out. How do you feel about your partner right now? It's awesome, isn't it? This is an incredible thing, and I think this comes from improvisation. I get, to, I get to teach people improvisation in all different contexts. Some of them want to be performers. Many of them want to be better team members or creative leaders. And when we are successful, 
we know that we bond. When people do something and they have a win together, as long as they're not arguing over who gets credit, they feel connected. But when they fail together without blaming each other, the bond is even more powerful. There's something about it. And so we have to fail together cheerfully early on in order to get into this work. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you all of improv in this slide. These are the concepts. You wanna accept your partner's offers, say yes and, be obvious, it's not about you. Mistakes are gifts, just do what's needed, and imagination is simply perception. I am gonna, I'm gonna take questions right now if there's anything here you want me to elucidate, but then I'm gonna move on to the next big concept. So what, what here uh, draws your attention? What do you, what's confusing or you wanna know more about? Yeah. Oh, this is great. Thanks for asking. Here's the deal. Uh, Keith Johnstone talks about this, and it, it, it was mind-blowing to me when I first heard about it. Your job is not to think up stuff. You don't have to be creative by being inventive and, and grinding and pushing and trying to be good. Notice. It's just like noticing and perceiving things. Imagine that there's a box sitting on your lap right now. Not an amazing box, just a box. Pretend there's a box on your lap and look down at it. Notice what kind of box your brain gave you. How big is it? Feel the edges of it. Go ahead and grab the edges of the box. For real, do this right now. Feel the size. It gave you a specific size. Commit to that. That's how big your box is. Notice what it's made out of. Don't think up something cool. Just notice, is it cardboard? Is it wood? Is it plastic? What color is it? Feel the texture of it. Your brain is just giving you that. Just notice it like perception rather than imagination. Do this, open the box. Go ahead and open it. You have no idea what's inside. Look in and see what your brain gives you. Notice and perceive what's in there. If your brain doesn't give you something, sometimes you have to reach in and feel it. If it's not visual, you might grab it. And then tactily, you can hold it. Oh, wow, check it out. Turn to the part partner, turn to the person next to you and tell them what you found in your box. Just describe it for 20 seconds. All right. Yeah, another question. Yeah. Can you talk about yes and? Um, can I talk about yes and? Sure. Yes and is, is uh, as Kathy reminded us, in some ways it's the most fundamental principle of improv. Your job is to accept your partner's offers, whatever is there in the world. It could be your partner's, it could be, it could be the, uh, an accident or a random thing that happens. You wanna say yes to it and acknowledge it rather than say no and knock it down. But it's not enough to say yes. You have to say yes and then add to it. You say yes and and build on it. A lot of times people say yes and that's a bad idea. <laughs> it's, like they, it's, like, it's like they know the words but they don't know the spirit. Or you even see people that say, yes, and here's another idea that I was thinking of before you started talking. <laughs> it's not and. You have to hear the words, and, and, the, and you have to receive the idea and build on it. Great. Yes? Yeah. Uh, do what's needed is, is also a, an extremely liberating mindset for an improviser. Your job is not to be wildly inventive and creative. It's to do what's needed. And sometimes when it's on stage, it's what does the audience want? It's part of being obvious as well. If what's needed in the scene is the hero, then step in and play the hero, whether or not you're good at being a hero. If what's needed is a villain, be the villain. If what's needed is a tree, be a tree. Like, do what's needed in the scene. Yeah. Let me show you this next piece, because this is huge. I teach a, a nine-week class on this in the business school. This is about status. Uh, I think for a moment about your birthday, and does your birthday fall on an odd date or an even date? An odd date or an even date? Okay, if, um, let me, uh, I'll just give you this quick rundown of these concepts and then we'll do an exercise. Actually, I'll go back to the concepts after the exercise. Odd date or even date? Even numbered birthday people, I want you to have your eyes open. If you have an odd numbered birthday, close your eyes. I don't want you to see this slide. Even number of people, I'm gonna have instructions on this slide. Even number birthday, these are the instructions for the next activity. So read this silently and then do them. If you can all see that, read those silently. During the next exercise, you'll do those, you will do those things. Okay, good. Now I want even number of people to close your eyes. Odd number of people, you can open your eyes. Odd number of birthdays, open your eyes. These are your directions in the next exercise. 
Whoever you talk to, whether it's an odd or an even, I want you to do these things. I want you to do these three things. We're going to do this for, we're going to do this for about 60 seconds, and you're going to follow these directions. You can talk to people, anyone around you, whatever, whatever their birthday is. Okay, good. Everyone open, uh, uh, whoop, everyone open your eyes. And uh, stand up for a moment and pretend you're at a cocktail party. It's after, uh, I don't know, an all-day conference on business and humor. And you're going to chat a little bit about what's going on. But do your directions. Ready? Go. Mingle around and talk to more people. Just mingle a little bit. You got about 30 more seconds. Talk to someone else. All right, good. Have a seat. Go ahead and have a seat. You can go back to your natural physical patterns. So, Normally what I'll do is I'll run this exercise and then I'll ask people, what are the things that you noticed and what are the things that you felt? I'll ask, uh, I'll ask the odd-numbered people if they think they talked to anyone from the even-numbered group and what they thought they were doing. But I realize it's hard to tell who was in which group, so you might not have noticed. What's more interesting is how did you personally feel? So people who are in the, uh, the odd-numbered group, how did you feel doing that just now? Who were crazy. <laughs> the odd-numbered group felt crazy. What else? agitated and crazy. Um, what else? Distracted. Distracted. Their directions were what? Call out. What were your directions? It was touch your face, fidget, right? Adjust your clothes. These are, these are things that signal not just to other people but to yourself that you're feeling less confident, that you're less sure of yourself and you're playing a, we call it low status in the Keith Johnstone description, low status. And then in the other group, in the uh, even-numbered group, how did you feel? Focused, confident. Competitive. And yours was what? Maintain eye contact. And eye contact sends this great signal. When you maintain eye contact, it, it conveys this confidence and security. I call these behaviors anchor behaviors because other behaviors cluster around them. When you're maintaining eye contact, you're also more likely to speak in complete sentences. You're more likely to keep your head still when you talk. You're more likely to take full breaths, and you're more likely to be grounded and connected to where you're standing. It doesn't have to be. You can maintain eye contact and still be really dodgy and shifty. It's just a weird combo. <laughs> I want to I wanna put direct your attention to these points. The ways you move and the ways you speak are sending signals constantly to everyone, including yourself. They're signaling, in a sense, they're signaling where as mammals we rank in the hierarchy, and it's dynamic and it's always changing. We adjust our status based on the situation. We play high status in some contexts and low status in another. We play too high and then we lower our status, or we play too low and then we raise it. You, you felt this yourself. You've made a statement in a, in a room, and, you, and it's too declarative. It's too bold a statement. And so you say, I think this is the way it is. Don't you? <laughs> right? And you, under, you sort of drop a little bit. You, or, or I love this. You've watched someone walking down the street, and they, uh, and they trip, which is a real great way to lower your status. They go like this. Like, <laughs> right? They just make, they have to make an adjustment. Like, it's too, you can't, it's like, keep getting lower. I talk about it in the, when I'm in the classroom and students come in late to class. You don't, you can't walk, in, walking in late is too high status. And so when they come in late to a class, they, they always get small. They walk in and they don't look at me. I'm just going to sneak over here. They go way around behind everyone. Nobody walks into the class late like this. <laughs> get up. I'm sitting there. Get up. You know, they don't, it's too high. Like we're constantly adjusting. You, the status that you play habitually is a strategy. It's not who you are. There are people who are habitual high-status players, and there are people who are habitual low-status players, and it, it has gotten you through life so far, so you've kept with it. When we play with improv and we practice improv and we reveal these, uh, the secret language of status, we expand our range. So there are times when you are, you are dropping your status when you don't need to. 
And there are times when you are too big and you are taking up more space than you need to and you are less effective. So improv is an opportunity to expand your range. I want to show you this, this last piece. I talk about play. We all used to play. Everyone did. I assume that if you made it into this room, you probably do still play some more. This is a play space. This draws playful people to it. But you probably don't play as much as you did when you were a kid. We're often best remembered for our play. A lot of this work and these thoughts come from uh, one of my colleagues at Stanford, Stuart Brown, who started the Institute for Play. And he studied obituaries, and he looked at how people are remembered. And it's not for you know, their quarterly reports. It's for their pranks and practical jokes and their, their sports team af affections and their, the things that they do in their leisure time. It's one of the fastest ways that we bond. The ways that we connect with each other is to play at some level. If you find the way someone plays, you end up forming a quick, fast connection, which in and of itself will boost your collective creativity. Our own childhood play profile is our best clue about how to bring back play in our lives. This is my favorite part of this. I'm gonna show you what Stuart Brown lists as, uh, as the various, as some categories of childhood play profiles. Think about how you used to play when you were a kid. What were the games that you loved? What were the activities that you loved? What would you get lost doing for hours? See if it falls into one of these categories. The joker, the, who would make people laugh and joke around. The, the kinesthete, that's like a, that could be a dancer or an athlete or playing sports, something with your body. The explorer, that could be um, that could be hiking, it could be, a it could be um, emotional exploration or relationship exploration, but somewhere where you're going into new undiscovered territory. The competitor who wants to win, it could be cards or soccer, doesn't matter. The director who creates worlds and runs them. The collector who gathers stuff, like baseball cards for me, or the artist creator. Think about your profile, and it might be a couple. When I think about my childhood, I see myself as, the, as a director joker, I would love to make people laugh, and I love being a dungeon master in, Drag in Dungeons and Dragons. Like, that's it. Those are, those are the core. Thank you. <laughs> those are the core things. What is your play profile? Think about it and tell the person next to you. What was your childhood play profile? Go ahead. Now, I'm going to be very directive right now. This is a conversation that can keep going, but I'm going to force you into a, a different area. How can you bring that play profile into your work life right now? How can you bring more Joker Director into your specific work? Your play profile in your work, and you have 60 seconds to tell your partner about that. Go. All right. Good. All right, and I realize that what I've done is opened up sort of a, a six-week workshop for you or a full-time session, but I want to I highlight that we're, we've opened it up. I want to push you towards thinking about this because the, the satisfaction in your work and your amount of, the amount of creativity that can come from tapping back into that childhood play is, is immense. Does anyone have a question that I could answer? Before I, before I wrap this up. Is there a question that's burning for you? And I'll stick around and talk with people afterwards if you want to. Yes? I'm really curious because the woman that I did it with and I both feel like we're still doing those things. Yeah. Who, do you want to know about the room? That's what I was yeah, thinking. me too. Who's, who feels like they're doing the things from their childhood? But that's awesome. Wow, what a room. Who feels like that was really depressing to see all those other hands go up around me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I bet that this room is different from most others, and I'm glad you asked that. That's really great. Cool. I want to tell you guys about a study. Yeah, you have a question? I feel I do it outside of my job, but the second one is the one I, I am, but I don't see how I can bring how that can in my job. How do you do it job. in your job? What's yes. your job? Uh, marketing. How, marketing. How could she bring kinesthete into marketing? Go door to door. Go door, -to -door. <laughs> 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 Boom. Done. Solved. Got you. I want, to wrap up, I want to wrap up today by telling you guys about a study. Um, they, they looked at people who practiced improvisation in a group. It had to be a group of at least six, 
and it was over an extended period, uh, and, and it was 10 weeks once a week. But it's interesting because they didn't end up having, they didn't have to perform for the, for the results to come out. What they did was they, they followed a group that, that did, and it was a double blind study with a control, practiced improv for 10 weeks. They found that there was a, uh, a statistically significant reduction in their blood pressure. And their general uh, Madsen score, which is a score of um, uh, sort of like life happiness, they also, uh, their, their Madsen score, no, actually it went up, that's, that's positive that it went up, um, but their stress, their APGAR stress scale level went down to three. They had a significantly higher, um, uh, their salaries went up, their romantic relationships improved both in uh, duration and frequency. You can figure out what that means. I'm not sure. <laughs> they had more. They had they had broader and deeper social and professional networks. Now that study is made up. That's fake. I did. It's not. It hasn't been done yet. <laughs> but I just wanted to share that with you as an example of the power of imagination and improv. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Cool. Oh.